All right, here we go. Hello. And welcome to Free Together, Free Apart, Hacking Family Success. You're in the living room of the Vermont Center for Family Studies, and you're very welcome to be here. Our mission is to strengthen families of all kinds. And today I'm really happy to have as my guest, Joy O'Neill. Hi, Joy. Hi. As you know, I'm Eric Thompson. I'm the uh, executive director of the Vermont Center for Family Studies. And we're going to talk about couples today. I'm excited. That's a good topic, Joy. Oh, it's a great topic. It's an interesting topic. For sure. Fascinated. I've been fascinated with couples my whole life. Ever since Stacy Moody in fourth grade. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to hear about Stacy. <laughs> that was the first time I had a crush, and it was it was really like, wow, what is this feeling? Yeah. Uh, I, I you're going there. I was thinking Tommy Korea. Yes, have not thought of that name in a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that so, was fifth grade. Yeah, it's it's absolutely fascinating to me. My parents got divorced when I was fourteen, and. I just think I would came out of my childhood really wondering how to pull off a satisfying, sustainable marriage. Yeah. Um, it didn't seem simple to me. There were people getting divorced all around me. And of course our divorce rate in the country is like, you know, 50% or whatever. Right. Right. And um, I like our topic title, you know, uh, coaching couples towards sustainable, satisfying marriage. I wondered whether I should put marriage in the title and I decided to do it because I think most people, that's what they want. Satisfying, sustainable marriage. Yeah, I, I guess I hadn't quite thought of that, marriage versus relationship. Mm -hmm. what, it, what is it about marriage that makes you think that? Yeah. like? Well, I mean, I know there's variation and I don't want to exclude anybody, but um, it's interesting to me that humans have this long, long tradition of making this contract mm. and pairing up for life. And one thing I really think a lot about and like to do is celebrate the successes of that. Mm. I think when it happens, there's huge benefits, you know, and people tend to become more and more aware of that as they get older. Yeah. But when you, you know, this, this whole tradition of celebrating a 50th anniversary, you know, it really gets to people when people can pull that off. Mm. And especially, you know, I, it's satisfying and sustainable is, is the target. Yeah. Um, and, and they're still talking to each other, right? After yeah, this, they even enjoying yeah. each other and more than ever. Yeah. And I was thinking about the title of this whole series, "Free Together, Free Apart," and you know what? A, I love the aspirational nature of that m sort of message in Bowen theory of the, the trickiness of that, that you could, you maybe you could be free only when you're apart <laughs> <laughs> or you could only be free when you're together. Mm. Both of those are less stable situations, but to have them both where you really feel that sense of kind of really feel pretty free together. I can be me. You can be you. I feel free to grow. I can, learn new things. I can go on adventures. And I also feel free apart. If you go on adventures, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. And it's just, it's an experience like to be able to have, to have both. Um, Eric, when we talked about this, I know you said, are you not, you, we're just going to talk, we're gonna have this conversation. Don't don't think about anything ahead of time. But of course, like, I'm like, okay, I, I got to ask my man this morning, like, <laughs> what, 
you know, I was thinking about the words sustainable and satisfying. And that was one of the things was like to know that you can, you can do you and it's all good. Like you can go and, and be a part and that feels great. And you can also enjoy these things together. I was like, and that, that feels great. Like all, all of it, having both and to absolutely be who you are in the presence of someone else, hmm. not holding back in any way. I think that is so sustainable. Like, or that's what, that is so, sorry, that's so satisfying. I think that's more the satisfying part is absolutely being who you are in relationship with someone else. Yeah, when you're in their company or when you're doing your own thing. Mm -hmm. And that makes it maybe sustainable. I'd like to be able to do that. I think it's true that what often disrupts the sustainability of a relationship is when one or more people start to feel I cannot be myself in this relationship. By the way, I didn't fully introduce Joy O'Neill. So Joy is um, a new member of the faculty of the Vermont Center for Family Studies, somebody who's put a lot of serious years into thinking about Bowen theory. Um, you know, I've been along for some of that ride and heard just the, uh, the disciplined effort Joy has made to think through the sticky places at times in a key relationship or a high stakes relationship and go on that journey of, okay, what am I going to do to manage me in this? <laughs> Which I really think is, you know, one of this great opportunities in any Bowen theory journey and journey in these training programs across the country really provide a structured place for people to explore that particular move. But Joy is also a very experienced couples therapist. She has a lot of passion for sitting in the room with a, a couple and helping them. So in this conversation today, I'm looking forward to both talking about just couples in general, but also the, the art of couples counseling. Did I introduce you well? Oh, I think you did all right. <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> um, Speaking of which, I want to do a quick poll here to find out who's here and what they're interested in. So this is just a two question poll that I'm going to launch now. And if you can just um, give us some information about you, where you're coming from, don't know all of you. And um, can you see the poll now? People see, I, I can start to see the answers are coming in. Oh, good. And then I'll share the results. So yeah, I did a lot of couples therapy too, Joy. I had a lot of couples in my practice um, for many, many years and found it to be a great challenge. Yeah, you know, it's all the years I've known you. We haven't talked so much about, we've talked about other work you've done. We haven't talked as much about the couples work. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious from going back in that time for you, like, mm -hmm. I think now I know a little bit what drew you into it when you started, when you were just starting to talk about it, but what was it that grabbed your curiosity when you were working with couples or what was it that got you um, mm. just invested in doing that work, period? That's a great question. So let's look at the results of this poll. <clears throat> okay. A lot of people interested in building a satisfying, sustainable couple. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't it sound so good? And a lot of people interested in the art of coaching couples too. So that's good to know. Yeah, that's a good question. I think I just have such a huge passion for the topic. Mm -hmm. I was fascinated. And I really needed to go on a journey to figure out, for me, it just, I didn't know coming out of childhood whether I'd be able to pull off a satisfying, stable marriage. I wanted it. I wanted to have kids. I wanted my kids to be in that situation. 
and I had a lot of doubt. I didn't know if I could. I, it kind of amazes me to, to think of somebody coming out of their childhood without doubt of that. And I'm sure many people on the call were different than me that way and didn't have that doubt. Did you? Would you were you uh, confident about it or? So confident, no. Desirous, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So rather than um, divorced parents, I had parents that had the the stuck together version <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> that um there were times where i was like oh i i kind of was hoping that i had susie's parents who had divorced at that point like mm. you know they they did all right but when conflict hit there was just a lot of tension in mm. the house and sometimes i fantasized about what would that be like for them um to have less of that tension would the separation bring more bring less tension to the family um funny thing is actually as they've grown grown older mm -hmm. they are they have a good time together they are now now that i see my parents they have a pretty good time together um i we talk more about that but so i don't know that i was confident but i was definitely desirous i was desirous of you know finding that partner relationship or finding myself in a way that I could just be myself and not, uh, yeah, not have to hold back. Also though, another thing I was thinking about that makes things pretty satisfying is a little element of mystery in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily secret, but they're like, I love learning new things. Like I love learning new things about my partner, myself. And like, I love that I don't know everything and things are changing all the time. And so that, I think that makes things more satisfying. Yeah, for sure. And to feel I, like you don't have it figured out. One, one thought I have about that is like, how do I manage myself in a marriage, my marriage? Um, if I am on an adventure in my own life, mm -hmm. I'm a better husband. Right. I, I have much less preoccupation with what my wife is doing or not doing. Yeah. And I can really see that range. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think I've developed a very strong belief system and principle about if there's a problem in my life, it's not about somebody else. Yeah. It's not about one of my kids, even though I could be thinking of that, about that for even maybe two whole days <laughs> <laughs> or my spouse. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think when I was doing couples uh, counseling and I still talk to people about marriages a lot, that principle is probably just bedrock for me is, you know, if they're struggling with something about me and somebody else, um, how are you going to find a way to make that into an adventure that has really much more to do with you and yourself? Yeah. If you could do that, you know, I just find that to be a very effective way of moving through those sorts of challenges. Certainly better than the classic mistake of getting really wrapped up and seeing if you can make the other person stop doing whatever it is that's stimulating <laughs> that emotion of frustration or whatever it is in you. Yeah. Um, I know I just, it was interesting to watch couples get completely wrapped up in that agenda and in different ways or different flavors of that, but then sometimes so inspiring to watch somebody really pull out of that mindset. Totally. Totally. Can you relate to that? Yeah. Well, I was also thinking what you just said about, I love this part about when you're doing something that you're more satisfied in, or you're like engaged in something mm. that's fulfilling for you, then you're just a better, you're a better partner mm. too. Like then things are going better all around. And it's like, is that is that part of what it takes to have satisfying, sustaining relationship is to satisfy yourself and to put the effort 
and to sell. But on the other front, in terms of like coaching couples, yes, all the time, there's that um, invitation in to like, could you just look at my partner and, and tell them what they need to do differently so I can feel better? <laughs> we could do this in like three sessions, right? You, you could go fix that thing that's driving me crazy that they do. Yeah, I think you're talking about that, that classic scenario that you're being invited by one or both yeah. to say, look, hey, how about you and I can together fix mm -hmm. him or fix her? Um, yeah, so I want to ask you, what's your game for dealing with that now? How is that emerging and growing? I know you to be a student of the art of these things. So yeah. what are you learning about how to handle that basic situation, which whether you're a couples therapist or not, you're going to be in that a lot with family members or whatever. Hey, how about if you and I take care of fix that one? Yeah. Team up with me. What do you like, think about that? <laughs> um, yeah. So that, that has been a journey for sure. And I have a lot, I don't, it sounds odd, but I have a lot of fun with that journey. And actually the first thing I usually do is to let people know I'm not that good at it. I'm not, I'm not so good at the, like, you know, the teaming up dynamic. I'm like, there might be other people that do that really well. I just, I haven't figured that out yet. Like I seriously, like just tell people flat out that that, um, it doesn't interest me. I'm not good at it. It's just so pretty quickly when I'm working with a couple and there's the invite, like the invitation to do that. Could mm. you, could you just like come into my court over here and help me out with this one? Yeah. Um, I put it on myself in a way and it's true. It's, I really am not that good at it. So I don't pretend like I am or, you know, I am sure there are times when there's a, you know, I experience feeling caught or there's something about. Yeah. Specific... Start, you start liking one of them more than the other. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. I, want to, I want to stop on that, that interesting uh, thing you've discovered there, because just to unpack it a little, what I would see in terms of the Bowen theory, it's a very, profound but simple detriangling move yeah and what's interesting to me about it is you're not telling the other person to stop doing anything yeah. in other words let's pretend the husband is saying listen okay joy i want you to really understand the way she is so like she's really out of control like she screams at my daughter do you want to hear joy how she screams i can show you and you come back with this you know i don't know how to the way you were just doing that it's interesting to me that you're not telling them to stop. Yeah. And also, nor are you unclear about what you will and won't do in this situation with them. It's pretty clear. I'm not that good at it. And it's it's got this wonderful disarming quality too of, um, hey, uh, guess what? I, I'm not trying to be perfect here. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's get that right out of the, totally. out of the game here. <laughs> And you mentioned fun. So tell me a little bit more about fun in your work as a couples therapist. You know, like I truly, it's been different. I will say doing this all over video. Mm -hmm. um, I admit I'm, I'm missing like the nuances of, or not the nuances, but the like the couples either first thing when they would come in my office, it would be on the couch, maybe together and really close together, or maybe one in one side of the room and one in the other side of the room. And like seeing all of that movement, I always, I always love like seeing the interaction of the couple. So on the screen, it's different because automatically, I have had couples ask me like, can, can we do it from two different places? And sometimes that happens, but for the most part, they're in the same room, they're together and they actually have to be pretty close in proximity. Mm -hmm. um, so what's fun is, for me is it, even those first sessions and like meeting a new couple and getting to, getting to know each of them and understanding who they are or just, or getting curious about who they are. I'm fascinated by people, period. Mm. 
but is very different than doing individual work because there I am and I get to witness relationship happening right there in front of me and be curious about it and be um, and feel like there's so much I'm learning along the way. So maybe that's part of what what brings out the fun for me if I like have a, a natural fascin absolute fascination with this and and but I mean you can be fascinated and not having fun. I think um, I think for for many really good couples therapists or really probably just helpers period um, fun is a good marker that you're not you haven't become sucked into the problem that they have yeah. If, if you're sucked into it, it's awfully serious. Yeah. And it's actually kind of tricky to be fun, having fun and not, but not in a sarcastic way, you know, right. not in a way that it misses that respectfulness. Right. Right. Got any thoughts about that? How, how, how do you do that? Or how are you doing with having fun? in these situations? Is it pretty hard? Are you feeling getting better at it? I definitely feel like I'm getting better at it. And I think I'm getting better at it only because I feel less, maybe less of the absorption of the distance or the conflict or the problem or whatever the, I think, I think initially when I started doing this work, it was like, oh, if there's too much conflict in my room, I don't know how I'm going to do with that. Like I would that was not fun for me. I wasn't yeah. drawn into conflict mm -hmm. or too much tension. This is not mm -hmm. very fun. But the fun part, yeah, it is that it, it's so human, right? Like relationships are just, they're natural, they're evolutionary, they are, they are fascinating. So the fun part comes in where you're just, um, Nah, describe it, but it's this land of everybody's trying to figure something out, right? We're hmm. no better, no worse, no, like everybody's got their stuff that they're trying to work through and in different ways and different attempts and to be in there and to have that, um, I think automatically, sometimes people coming to see me, there's a little bit of instant relief that comes from being able to have a conversation with their person mm. or with me that brings attention down. And once attention is down a little bit, there is that flow of like, we can be a little playful with this. Mm. Sometimes it's, you know, this isn't the first time that somebody might have come in and said, oh my gosh, I'm going like this. I thought we were in really good shape. And now all of a sudden we're under quarantine for like, we went from never seeing each other to now we're all in this one space together having to figure things out and wow and to be able to make room and space for that to be okay and for it to be what it is as opposed to feel even the need to change something about it or do something with it just try to be yeah be understanding or curious about what is going on. It reminds me of the great poet, a German poet, Rainer Maria Rilke, and he wrote this book, Letters to a Young Poet, and in there there's this famous line about learning to love the questions. And yeah. it sounds like you're pretty good at, um, at, at letting it be kind of a lot of space, like this process of trying to figure something out, very normal, very good, good thing to be involved in. And not in a big rush, mm -mm. you know, like taking some of the desperation out of it. Yeah. I was just thinking another element of, um, of that, that fun part of it is just appreciating the people. Yeah. Like if you can appreciate two people who are in a conflict, say, cause not, of course they're not always in conflict. Um, sometimes it's, someone who's frustrated and another person who's really depressed, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if somebody can sit with any two parties and appreciate both of them, yeah, that's a unique 
I think that's a characteristic of healthy separateness from it. Yeah. Um, instead of being caught in one of these people is a problem or both of them is a problem to be more seeing they're both, they're both sort of solutions waiting to happen and interesting puzzles mm -hmm. that are, you know, part of life. Yeah. So, and just to be in that zone of curiosity, like the thing about the questions is I'm lately, I've been thinking more and more about like, Oh, it's not about me figuring out what question to ask or, um, how to ask this question or who to ask it to, or like, it's more about finding out what their questions are. What are the questions? Like, and I'm loving the questions that people are coming up with. Huh. And so you're saying that you sort of are, um, moving into a space where you're not even feeling necessarily responsible for coming up with the questions. But instead, I, I don't know if this is what you mean, but I, but that you know that they actually, the best questions are the ones that they have. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this has been a little bit more, more recently, I think I've been moving in this direction or thinking about it more. So it's kind of influencing how I'm sitting with people. But yeah, I think it's it's almost like, I wonder if it has to do with like, I'm trusting in myself a little bit more. So I'm trusting in others a little bit more. So I, I think there's something, something happening there. So yeah, I, I feel like I can sit with somebody and wonder, like, um, try to understand what their questions are rather than sit there thinking about as they're talking, like, huh, I, I probably have a, you know, I need to say something thoughtful or summative or like get that perfect curious question launched there because the moment I start going there honestly Eric I start to think that maybe I you know do I have an agenda for this couple I need to so always stepping back and learning more about their individual agendas their relationship agenda is what I find makes it even more fun <laughs> um definitely more interesting for me. I, um, this was not that long ago, I heard Michael Kerr said that, so he was coached by Bowen. Bowen said to him, you know, essentially like the recipe for good relationships is trust, respect, and cutting each other some slack. And I, I think about that a lot when I think about that in my own life, for sure. And I think about that when uh, often when working with couples, like how important it is, like the trust and respect. Okay, sure. That's a given. Like if we're going to talk about having great relationships, you want to be working off of those premises. We hear that all the time. But the third one, cutting each other some slack. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Like. I love that simple, you know, um, one thing I think is, is what we've gotten into here, um, is talking about the art of being connected to two people who are trying to solve a puzzle mm -hmm. without taking too much responsibility for solving it. And that, you know, it's the helper's art, the, the helper wants to help, but most helpers get learn that over helpfulness is the biggest pitfall. Totally. Um, one thing I want to just throw in before we uh, move towards having a little uh, opportunity for people to break out and just talk about what this conversation has got them thinking about mm -hmm. is, you know, when you said that about trust and respect. So how about these situations where it's, it's kind of heavy, there's something pretty heavy, like yeah. betrayal has happened or one person has is, is very seriously thinking about getting out of the marriage and um, maybe the trust, there's tr serious trust breaches or uh, serious respect breaches happening where one person is just, you know, I mean, I would have that happen sometimes where you just 
two people come in and one of them is just, they're really on the other one. I yeah. mean, they are just this really, really, I'm really, really negative about you. Yeah. And I'm not going to mince it. I'm coming at you with it. And um, I think, you know, one thing I think Bowen was very useful to me in dealing with that, because it's, it's heavy to deal with that. Totally. And um, it's just to recognize no matter what is going on between them, they both played a role in how it got that way. Yeah. And that was, that's like, okay, now I found my balance again. Yeah. And I'm now I'm curious. Um, sometimes I would have to structure. I, I got more and more into really structuring the meetings. I'm kind of curious how you think about that. But um, I got more into, um, especially in a situation like that, okay, I'm going to control how the conversation happens. I'm not going to control what you say. Yeah. And basically, I'm going to, um, I'm when I talk to one person, my agenda is I'm fascinated with knowing what you think about your role in what's going on here. Absolutely. Pivot over to the other one. Now I'm fascinated in what you think about your role and what's going on here. And even if they're not that interested in that, if I stay steadily interested in that, to me, you know, okay, I'm, I'm doing about the best I can do here. Yeah. Yeah. Do you relate to that? Uh, I totally relate to that. It wasn't um, until I started doing Bowen work that I really practiced that specific structured model and now so I do a lot of that in the sessions and then as there's more um, I don't know what it is maybe more of a self is coming forward and there's been like um, there's been a lot of listening and hearing and understanding and room, you know, and the tension has maybe come down. Sometimes it's not always outside of the sessions that's come down, but it's come down for sure in the sessions. And because I think with absence of structure and some of the high conflict, um, more distant relationships, then there it's, I, I don't feel like I'm showing up. It doesn't feel as productive. I I'm, I'm also like, I'm a, Mm. Latin for being productive in work again without an agenda of like it has to go this way or that way but I it's important to me that whatever each individual or the couple is coming in and says they want to get out of it that as a we're working towards that so I I access that structure the other thing I do eventually once that all those systems are in place and that's been going well and there's a lot of like you know thinking about how do I take a leadership role in this family? Am I interested or is this person, in, whatever's happening. Then I move a little bit more towards the couple talking to each other with their permission that I can, I can be really rude and interrupt or, you know, um, yeah. or get curious in the middle of something or so I still, I'm very huh. present in the model, but yeah. that happens more when um, there's the less reactivity in the room, I would say. But I do find, here's why I love that too, because there's a lot of, your nervous system is automatically calmed down by looking at your person. And sometimes I'm working with couples that there has been less and less of that as mm -hmm. tension has progressed. So inviting that exercise in with the support of mm -hmm. the therapy or of the coaching mm -hmm. seems to be really helpful mm -hmm. or sometimes, you know. Yeah. Well, so I, I hear you saying you're kind of balancing that, really providing structure and then backing off from that and then coming back in and backing off that learning to balance. When do you do that? When do you not? The other thing I heard in what you're saying is that you have this kind of mission to, I have to make this work for me. And I think one of the reasons why a lot of people don't want to do couples therapy, even therapists, is because it's it's kind of dangerous in a way. You're, it's a two-on-one. There's more energy and they're very reactive to each other. So you're going to deal with all that right in your office. So 
this ability you're talking about from the beginning here in this conversation to say, look, there's a way that I have to make this work for me. Yeah. And I'm, I'm doing, that's my job. I'm yeah. on that job. Yeah. Don't you worry. I'm on that job. Yeah. That's not your job. That's my job. Watch, I'm doing it. All right. I want to um, move now to this uh, breakout opportunity. Um, and then what we're going to do, just do a 10 minute breakout and then come back and we can have some interaction with all you guys about the stuff you've been thinking about or what we've been talking about. And um, so a little orientation to the breakout, which is that if you haven't been on here before, people seem to really like this. Even I've heard many people say, oh, I didn't want to do that breakout thing. And then I did it. And I really was glad I did. So um, encourage you to try it. But if you're really convinced you don't want to do it, here's, here's the thing you could do to help me out right now is go off the meeting and come back in 10 minutes. Because what then happens is when the breakout function populates, you won't, we won't have somebody who's sitting there with a person who's not there. So um, I'm going to share some, um, here's some guidelines uh, for how you might conduct this breakout portion of this meeting. The main point of it, like it says here, is to, um, in the middle there, say what you really think, listen to what they really think. The purpose of this, as I see it, is to provide you with an opportunity to just do some thinking about a topic that's important to you. So um, <clears throat> I like that, providing people with time to think. And um, I'm gonna suggest you can skip the introductions. It's not, you, this time is gonna fly by and uh, it's not really about meeting new people. It's more about providing you with a place to think. And um, if it helps if somebody just kind of dives in and says, okay, well, let me tell you what I've been thinking about um, and, and, and talks for two, two or three minutes and then somebody else just grab the baton and go for it. <clears throat> so I am going to stop sharing. Group Joy. Um, I think, well, one thing that we started to touch on didn't go too much further is like that idea of because you you had mentioned it um when when there's two people in a group and one you know you do start to develop like oh i i can i can relate to this one over here much more than i can relate to that one over yeah. there and um and what do you do then like what happens yeah uh, but the other thing we talked about that I think is just so important in this work is like the over over functioning or the natural triangle of a of a system of a when you're doing couples work like uh, there's automatically a triangle so there's that invitation or can be that invitation to align and there's also can be an invitation to possibly work harder than mm. especially if the tension I think. You know, yeah. the tension is higher. It's like, oh. Yeah, the balancing of what you're responsible for and what you aren't. I love the workout in Bowen theory of that, that, that discipline effort. If you start seeing one person in the system, it could be like one of your brothers or one of your in-laws or one of the people in the couple. You start seeing one of them really as the villain. Yeah. And then to try to extract yourself from that mental mindset and see beyond that. Yeah, that is a, that that is I think this is just such a cool workout. So let me ask those of you who were in small groups, if any of you want to make a comment, what are you thinking about? What are you observing? Uh, I'm going to if you raise your hand or just you can just unmute yourself and make a comment. We've got a few minutes for that. Suzanne Brew, how was your small group? It was great. It was it was uh, it was great, and we. Um, You've decided you like these small groups now. I did. I, know. I, I was pretty resistant. <laughs> you told me to cancel them. Don't do those. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you don't listen to me. So um, no, I thought it was really um, interesting. We talked about just that challenge of being in a room with two people as opposed to one. You know, mm -hmm. and that when the tension. Um, is, is high and 
silences are great to have, but it's pretty hard. People might not think they're getting their money's worth. <laughs> yeah, I remember once I had a couple and I, there was a big silence and I said, so how's this going? And the husband and the wife said, I'm not getting that much out of it. And the husband looked at me and said, you better start working harder. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? What are you thinking about? What did this conversation get going for you? Um, you're muted, uh, whoever uh, that, Jody. Yeah. All right. right. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, one's neutrality and being able to stay neutral um, when you're faced with something that's, you know, really um, contrary to perhaps your own personal views and how to manage that, your own anxiety and manage yourself in that. Mm. What are you learning about the art of neutrality? What am I learning? Yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, wait. it's, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And I have to keep looking at myself and, and working on, my, on myself mm. and understanding why I'm getting hooked and, mm. you know, Master how much of art. that is, is Eric, you asked this the other day, how much of that is fun and how much of that is miserable doing that work? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Uh, what's the right answer? What's that? What is the correct answer to one's <laughs> managing one's neutrality? Wait, to what's what and what's neutrality? What is the answer to managing one's neutrality? What are we? What am uh, I learning? What's the right answer? What should I say? <laughs> Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> it's in some book somewhere. You just have to be part of it. <laughs> I like that. The teacher. I do think it for some people it becomes a fascinating lifelong journey. I've been yeah. waiting for that answer for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> we should have it by now. <laughs> Gordon Peterson, uh, what was interesting to you in your small group? Oh, just the, to remember uh, the triangle in, yeah. in, in a couple's process and to, 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 to recognize it, to respect it. And that, um, that to, to the degree one can, especially if the intensity is extremely high, to have the conversation go through the coach and not through to the, okay? And that's a nice way, that's an interesting way to, to, to display neutrality if you can. Because mm. I don't know how many people, when we've all seen it, and especially things are intense, the couple, they want to talk to each other in front of you versus having the conversation go through the coach. And there's something about that effort mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, can, um, you know, again, the, the, the first law of, of uh, Bowen thermodynamics is to try to reduce the anxiety. And how does one do that? Oh, yeah. Hopefully through the coach, hopefully through the coach. Yeah, I, I think you're right that that, that structure, which I, I guess, you know, Gordon uses it and it's common in Bowen theory um, circles that the couple does not actually talk to each other during the session and that the, the, the therapist, and then Mike Kerr wrote it up, this sort of um, evolution of this model, this technique actually in his book, um, Bowen theory secrets, but yeah. um, I found that to be incredibly valuable. And I think you um, just articulated one of the reasons that they are going to calm down if they know that this is not going to be a conversation that gets out of control. Right. Mm -hmm. And and some of that is is the the feeling of confidence. This person here can handle us. Mm -hmm. Well, you nailed it, Eric. That's the, uh, really, when, when, when high volatile and high intensity couples come in and the coach can demonstrate that, 
you know, it's almost like the Star Wars movie where it goes, ooh, it just kind of goes down. Yeah, it makes sense to me. Uh, that goes down and then creativity is going to come up very naturally. Yeah. You don't have to drag it up. Or um, I want to share with you a little bit um, right now what's coming up in this series. I'm very excited about what we're doing here. We've got interesting irons in the fire. Um, so... Three events that I've got planned so far. First, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this Moonlight Swim. It's a new course I am offering that flows out of the meditation and um, inner silence and healthy separateness conference. I'll tell you about that in a sec. Then you can see also, I'm really happy we're going to have Dan Papro here before Christmas. And, uh, you know, we, Vermont Center for Family Studies, he's like our father. He's He's been with us so much and we learned so much from him. I'm just looking forward to having a good conversation with Dan about the journey he's been on all these years. And then on January, interesting person, Ernie Pomerleau, who's very psychologically minded, has had an interesting journey with his own efforts with Bowen Theory, a succession story. For those of you who don't know, Ernie is just a well-known family business person here in Vermont. So this is the poster. You're going to get this. I don't expect you to look at all this detail here for this new offering, Moonlight Swim. It's really kind of an adventure for me. It's going to focus more on transcendental meditation. For those who are interested in this relationship between transcendental meditation or transcendence, the experience of transcendence, inner silence, and healthy separateness, this is a special, unique offering for those people um, participants will have to have learned TM beforehand because we're going to do a group meditations and a virtual TM one day retreat. And I put here expected outcomes, COVID resilience. I'll highlight that. It's just a good thing to be possibly doing in the middle of this COVID time to go inward even more and do it in a structured way with two people who are experienced with that. So Mark Roberts, who I'm going to do it with uh, the Thursday after Thanksgiving, he and I will be here to talk about that offering and talk about the idea in general of the connection between transcendence, inner silence, and healthy separateness, differentiation of self. And it flows out of this conference, which many of you know about, which the recordings are available. And I showed you this about Pepper and also coming uh, cl clinical conference morning event with Dr. Walter Smith that's coming working on scheduling that. But it is going to happen. And I do want to mention just thank you so much. We've been getting support for this program. And um, it's kind of amazing. Roz could give you the details, but it just, I tell you, it feels so good to see even small contributions coming in in the sense that people appreciate this. It encourages me to just keep on going. It isn't free to, to, uh, to produce this. Um, so if you appreciate it and you're moved to do some end of year sharing, uh, supporting us, this is what it goes towards, supporting families of all types. And uh, just to mention, those of you who don't know that we have this professional training program, it's set for this year, but we'll be doing it again next year. And that's one way you could go deeper into this journey with us of exploring the things we've been talking about today. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, we got a couple more minutes left. Anybody else got a comment? Yes, Eric Weiner, thank you. Um, I, I remember going to a, an annual meeting in DC year, or at Georgetown years ago and, and Dr. Bowen, we talked about this in our, in our small group, but Dr. Bowen, um, uh, the, the topic of marriage came up and, and Dr. Bowen kind of uh, playfully, perhaps sarcastically said, all you need is love. And uh, he and Dr. Kerr kind of just went back and forth on that. And I remember thinking, I mean, it, it just kind of blew my mind at the time <laughs> because I mean, we all we hear about in arts literature and, and music is love, all you need is love. And, um, uh, and, and, and maybe, may, maybe um, cutting the other some slack is an act of love. Um, uh, I could certainly see it as that, but but that whole idea of um, uh, what they what they talked about just really got me thinking in a very different kind of direction from how I was previously trained and what I believed um, uh, was important. So um, just wanted to put that out there. 
Eric, are you trying to tell me that the idea that going, if you're sitting there in a couple and you're thinking to yourself, hey, if you just love me more, things are going to be better. Are you telling me, you know, I'm not sure that's actually a good pathway to victory? <laughs> Keep the burst your bubble. <laughs> but I like you throwing in that, you know, maybe we don't emphasize love enough in Bowen theory. I mean, there's probably lots of different levels of love. And I'm interested in, in a really amazingly differentiated kind of love, which a person mm -hmm. might feel like just that true selfless kind, you know? That's that's a wonderful thing to read about in these um, wisdom traditions when people can sort of document their experiences of that, um, where it's it's truly not selfish. Hmm. All right, folks, very good to be with you. Have a good holiday. Really nice to see your faces. Thank, Thank you. you for coming into our conversation. And uh, maybe I'll see you. Come join us and check out this Moonlight Swim. It's going to Moonlight Swim. It's an experience, right? It's not intellectual. You go into the water and something happens. <laughs> so if you even just kind of curious and about that journey, that unique journey, come and we can talk about what it might mean to learn TM if that's something you haven't done before and well, on, onward. It's just, it's just now ending. In fact, they've gone a couple minutes over. So let me, let me just take care. Bye.